How's it going, guys? And welcome to a very special Storytime live stream. Joining us some very special J-Mods. Um, let's start with some introductions. Uh, Should we start? I'm Mod Wilson. I've been here for nine and a half years, and I'm a content developer on RootScape. All right. Hi, I'm Mod Noldor. I'm a technical QA engineer for RuneScape, and I've been here just shy of 11 years. Hi, I'm Ian Gower. Uh, I'm about as old school as it gets. I've been here pretty much forever. Uh, I've done graphics, content, game engine, you know, <laughs> everything really. <laughs> I'm Mod Mark. Um, I'm the design director for Jagex, and I've been here for 12 years. I had my 12th year anniversary last week. Hi, I'm Mod Ash. I've been here ten and a half years, and I'm currently a content developer on Old School RuneScape. All right, and I'm Mod Archie. I've been here for about four and a half months. <laughs> what? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's okay. I'm just hosting. <laughs> All right. So, um, pretty much the idea of this is is to really just create a, a natural environment where we just tell funny stories about the past and the beginning days of RuneScape and what it was like when it first began and what it's like to see it develop into what it is now. Um, so. Do we have anybody that wants to start? Well, in terms of where it began, I think we know where to start. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, effectively, it <laughs> began. Uh, it didn't quite begin in our parents' house because Andrew did some work for it uh, when he was living in Cambridge just after university, but a lot of the original work uh, uh, was working out of our parents' kitchen, so sort of next to the washing machine and the tumble dryer. Uh, so to see it turn into something as big as it has is <laughs> Yeah. Quite frankly, yeah. ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's been a fantastic journey. Yeah, uh, loved it. Um, for myself, I started. Uh, you know, it, it's people sort of ask, "Oh, were you there at the start?" And for me, it's hard to put an exact. You know, this was the start because I was writing games with my brothers, like throughout our childhood, we were writing board games, uh, writing games on the Atari ST, and then we moved on to Java games. Yeah. Um, uh, my initial involvement with RuneScape was the graphics, uh, so um, the identikit for the player, the 3D modelling, the uh, original RuneScape classic logo that you've got um, over there, which I don't think is actually just behind off, off shot. But, yeah, um, it's just off shot. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah, it's all right. It's the one the old school one uses. <laughs> um, yeah, but you, so yeah, you made loads of stuff, didn't you? you like, what uh, was it? Because like we, we were talking the other day about the bear and the... And the uh, bat. Um, <laughs> so I did a lot of the uh, original graphics, 2D graphics for uh, RuneScape Classic. Uh, also, my mum pitched in uh, a few graphics for that as well. Uh, she, you know, she was, um, you know, a very good painter, um, but she hadn't had a huge amount of experience with computer graphics up until that point. So I sort of showed the, uh, the ropes, and um, we were working with uh, uh, Paint Shop Pro because we could get it free on a cover disc on a magazine. <laughs> Quality um, software. <laughs> So that was that was where we worked back then. The original RuneScape logo was done in Extreme 3D, which is a 3D package you've never heard of, which was again on a computer magazine cover disc. And we'll um, never hear of it again. Probably <laughs> not. So, so what was, if we can go in order, the very first thing, if you remember it, that you worked on? What, in terms of RuneScape thing, or...? The first RuneScape thing, I should say. First RuneScape. The oldest thing that is in RuneScape Classic, I think, is probably the sheep, because the sheep was also in Devious Mud. So the sheep was the first thing you made? Um, for, for what we called RuneScape, obviously yeah. before that we made Devious Mud and I made a player identikit okay. for Devious Mud, uh, which I had to make on an Atari ST in incredibly low colours. Um, and for walking towards the camera, walking down the screen, we had a whole uh, one and a half frames of animation. <laughs> which might sound a little bit strange. Um, you had one frame of animation which was the left leg of the player forward. You flipped that to get the right leg forward and for when both legs were level I just do half a human and we mirrored that across the middle so we could get the download size as small as possible because this was when everyone was on you know sort of 56k modems yeah. if, they were lucky. Lucky. if they were lucky I think we had 33.6 at that point yeah, I, I think still I remember 28 asking like years and years ago so if like uh, when I was doing so computing back at GCSE level hey would it be possible to have sort of a game where loads of people could be playing it and it's sort of like no this is sheer madness, madness. <laughs> 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 you'd, you'd, never, you'd never be able to get anything like that and you know it, which just goes to show how old we all are <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, for me, the first thing that I worked on, where I can say that some concepts of mine went into the game, would be big chompy bird hunting. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, so I was working with a developer called Mod Titan at the time. He made a lot of the Mikey stuff and a lot of the mm. early quest content that you see in RuneScape Legends Guild, for example. Yep. 
and we we were he, he was asked to write a quest that featured some sort of low level ranging and uh, he decided to do a few more interesting things to do with ogres um, although the first time I appeared in the game was as an ogre called Og um, which was made by Ian Taylor for his Watchtower quest, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because he was needed to have a name for a loud, brash ogre. And I haven't <laughs> been in the company for very long, but these, all these boys will tell you I'm far too loud. And so I was making a lot of noise in <coughs> QA, and he, uh, and he decided to name the NPC after me. Interesting. Who would have thought? <laughs> Since I was in the support team for a few months when I first joined the company and then moved through QA up to contents, I'd been in Jagex for quite a long time before I started doing any developing for the game. But my first project of any significance would be The Wise Old Man, I guess. Yep. That and Make X for Cooking. Uh, but The Wise Old Man was a lot more interesting <laughs> and I think I had a lot more fun doing it. Especially when Paul Gower, um, looking at it, said, is there a reason he's got a telescope that's pointing at the bank? And there wasn't. It was just where his window was and where the telescope had been put. But then we thought there should be a reason he's got a telescope pointing at the bank, S like he's going to rob the bank. Mm. So a few months later, um, I had a chat with Mark and he let me do it. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing actually, particularly with Ash's stuff. Um, I had to really shake Ash and encourage him to do more story stuff because you weren't really convinced that it was any good and you couldn't really well, imagine yeah. that players would have any fun with We'd it. We've got professionals for that. Yeah, <laughs> but, but that's the kind of joy of, of uh, Jagex actually, is anyone who shows a spark of being able to do something quite cool gets the opportunity to do stuff. I mean, I'm like I started in customer support and then QA and moved and went through the kind of st the same jobs that Ash did. Um, and I think it's it's cool really that we're in a company where we get to do these things without necessarily having the right degrees or yeah. those kind of things to support it. I've still never studied computing. But yeah, really, <laughs> honestly, with all of the wise old man quests, mm. I really had to like say, come on, Ash, I want more content, and encouraging him to be even more absurd with things yeah. like My Arms Big Adventure, which is still one of my favourite bits of content, but anyway. Yes. The wise old man has, has turned into the most epic Probably NPC of all time, in my opinion. I think One so. of my personal favorites. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's Definitely. some stuff with um, Jasper. Um. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> yes. I think the only thing I've had directly go into the game as a, a something that I've, I've mentioned was the um, this is not a dating site in the quick chat. <laughs> that's about yeah. it. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can blame me for that. Yeah. Yeah. From my end, it was actually um, Olaf. <laughs> oh, because um, Olaf uh, part one was uh, what I did during my uh, sort of like practical trial. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so sort of like after, sort of like in terms of the first thing that got released, I think it was um, Skippy and the uh, fish bowls. Yes. Um, and of course the, the pet fish in the fish bowls. And then it was uh, shortly after that, it was um, uh, Trouble, not Trouble Brewing, one before. Rum, rum Deal? Rum Deal, that's yeah. it. Rum Deal and the, uh, the trick or treating zombie oh, yes. Halloween thing. I found graphics for those in our archive not long ago. What's that, sorry? I found those graphics still ah, looking yeah. back in our archive. Yeah, the trick-or-treat ones, yeah. Mm. For the zombies that fall apart when you say enough rude things about their mothers or whatever it was. Yes, <laughs> yes. Because we had, we had to kind of improvise that at the last moment because I remember Andrew sort of like came in and sort of just said, OK, can we, can we maybe tone it down a bit? Because I think it was a bit too rude <laughs> what, what you were saying to them. Rude or scary sort of like uh, stuff. And then we had to kind of tone it down sort of like right on the day. <laughs> That happened a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we were kind of making last-minute adjustments based <laughs> on last-minute feedback. Yep, it's uh, really kind of flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah. sometimes. Sometimes it was quite embarrassing, like the um, random event with um, that um, Sebastian No, the fastest gnome, where, which you've got. <laughs> <laughs> the idea yeah. was a random event oh, where you were kidnapped yeah. and forced to race against a gnome in That's an right. actual agility course. Yes, um, and the graphics guys time. made this beautiful Olympic stadium with obstacles everywhere. Um, that he would just skip because he was a cheating little git. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, it got through graphics, development, testing, and just before I was about to launch, build it into the release build for that week, I said, well, how is it an anti-bot feature? Because it's the same every time. A bot could do it better than a human. And we all said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we never launched it. <laughs> yeah. So it got this close to coming out, and you were the final say to say, this well, is actually kind of pointless. I had no official yeah. say. I was just <laughs> asking why we would what it was for, and the, the answer wasn't very good. Sometimes we can have so much fun in development that we kind of forget yeah. what our primary objective was to launch the project in the first place. I think that's a really good example. We were yeah. doing something yeah. to combat bots, 
and it didn't really do it. Yeah. Well, um, it's really interesting, actually. A lot of the random events, um, the, they weren't really doing their job anymore, and we wanted to rip them out of the game, but so many players were like, no, I really like those characters, because we'd, c we'd created characters out of them, yeah. and they didn't want to yeah. say goodbye to the sandwich lady or yeah. you know, cram random crazy drunken, dwarf. drunken yeah. dwarves and things, because yeah. we actually had fun with them. Yeah, we mm. kill them in quest cutscenes for no reason yeah. other than that we can. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> were, they, um, were they entirely created out of fiction, these, uh, these random events, or were they based off of actual people? Aside from, the, obviously, the wise old man you created. Well, I've never actually met anyone I could call a drunken dwarf. Because that would be quite That's rude. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. uh, sandwich, sandwich Lady, lady was definitely was. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, in the building, before this m marvellous, miraculous thing that we're in now, um, we, we used to be just over the road. Um, and uh, there were lots of very small offices. And the bigger we were getting, like we'd suddenly we'd have another six people that we would hire, so we'd have to get another little small office, and then we'd knock a hole the door <laughs> and put a door there. Like honestly, like you would sort of come into work one day and you'd be like, "All oh, right, the office is completely <laughs> changed, and there's a whole new bit with a whole new people, bunch of people in it, all building their own desks and computers." I, I mean, yes. yeah, uh, which was all, which was our kind of uh, you know um, rite of passage in the early days. Yeah, so. you, you, you started at the company and you got a flat pack desk, flat plaque chair and a bunch of computer components. Yeah. I'm glad we're past um, that, I'd still be building <laughs> yeah, mine. Yeah, and if you couldn't build them then uh, yeah, you yeah. were thought less of. There, there, yeah. was, there, <laughs> was, there, was the, there was the one guy who's uh, trialled in IT and after he built his computer switched it on and flames came out the back. He put the heat sink in backwards somehow. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ah. We seem to have digressed from the sandwich. Sorry. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so uh, because it was a kind of, uh, it was a start-up building really, so there were lots of companies there with small numbers of people. There was a canteen and they would have a sandwich lady that would come round yeah. to all of the uh, doors and she would knock on the door and she would <laughs> announce herself in a very high pitch, sandwiches, <laughs> like that. And w that was our, our so cue to get food. And she, what she did was she interrupted work. And so we took that as a concept <laughs> for something that could happen to you in the game where suddenly there was this sandwich lady who demanded that you identify her baked goods. Um, and it was entirely based, the model, the, the character, the stuff the that she was dressed the baguette. in. The baguette? Yeah. The yeah. baguette. Oh, yeah. So yeah. The, the way it worked was, <laughs> she, she went around the building in a certain order. And we, we, at one point, we were right at the start of her delivery route. Yes. And there was a, had you, a had, you, you had a good choice of different fillings. Later on, we moved to a different office and we were right at the end of her delivery route. And about the only thing left would be like, I don't know, cucumber and crest sandwiches uh, or something. Yeah. So, so if you asked her about any of the fillings which weren't there, you got... Short, short, she short. kind of hit yeah. you with a piece of bread. <laughs> she didn't quite hit you, but she you was thinking it. We knew she was thinking it. She so was a she very know? angry lady. So, <laughs> yeah, don't go for a sandwich which is, isn't appropriate. Did she ever find out? Do you think she? Oh, we told her that oh, okay. she was in the game. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's been quite a few people over the years that we've added to the game, like friends or, yeah. or like friends of of the. The, game. the baker from the north, I think. Um, there was a guy from North's Bakery who used to come and sell pies outside yes. our office yeah. every day. Yep. So the yeah. pie man in the Cook's Guild is a baker from the north. Okay. Yep. It's nothing to do with Majorat at all. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> There's so many people posting on forums right now. So, like, how, you know, I've been supporting that theory for years. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately not. All of my mm. fan fiction ruined. This is almost like a Mythbusters now. Um, yeah. r random events was actually a really kind of funny time for us because we were trying to do all sorts of different intelligent ways of, of combating uh, bot problems that yeah. we had there. Mm. Um, and coming up with these little events mm. worked quite well. And, but if you think about it over the years, like whether it's a sleeping bag or sandwich lady, there's all sorts of different things that we've tried over the years. One of my favourite stories was the choking vine that we uh, tried. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. You know, right, so, yes. so the choking vine. So this is a random event. Tangle vine. That mm -hmm. made it into the game for about three hours. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, its design was crazy now to even think that this is something we thought was a good idea. But basically, a vine would appear around you. So it would, uh, and the sort of um, map tiles around you, there would be this sort of vine graphic. And the way to combat it was to do nothing. Okay. So you would, if you moved, then you would take damage. And if you clicked on the screen, you would take damage. The thing that you had to do was nothing. And if you did nothing for 10 seconds, it would go away. Because we knew that bots were pre-programmed to move around and do certain things, and therefore they would kill themselves. Right. And we thought this was kind of amazing yeah. and a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, <laughs> 
generally speaking, as a gamer, if something happens to you that you don't understand, yeah. your instant reaction is yeah. to move the hell away from it. It's like quicksand. So it <laughs> appears in the game, and people are like, oh, what is this thing? Click on it, and it would do them damage. Yeah. And they're like, oh my god, I'm being damaged. They would just move. <laughs> click, move me away, move me away, click. And they're taking damage, and they're like, oh, I must move it. <laughs> they click faster, click faster. faster. <laughs> Dead. And uh, we put this live in the game, and we then went off on a jolly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we were just at the pub, actually. Um, and it might have just Jolly. been a Thursday evening where we always would go to the pub on a Thursday evening. Mm. And we were keeping an eye on the forums on our phones. Yeah. And, uh, and we were reading it and we were like, this is a bit dangerous, isn't it? And we'd had a few drinks. And then Andrew's like, right, I'm going back to the office. I'm fixing it. I'm taking that out of the game. So that's what he did. So he came, we all stayed at the pub, I think, if memory serves me right. Yeah, there were quite a few times where we, we'd been out drinking and then <laughs> yeah. something went horribly wrong. And so Andrew would have to <laughs> check back to the, back to the office and fix it. the servers. And he posted something on the forums to say, to say what he'd done and that he'd fixed it and yeah. that it was sorry that it hadn't quite worked out. And I think he was a little bit yeah. um, <laughs> under the influence at that point in time. And we read back the message the next day and we, <laughs> we all laughed because it didn't quite make sense. Uh, but we fixed it and that was the main thing to do. Uh, and yeah, there we go. That's one of my favourite stories. That's awesome. Uh, th there was another problem with the Tangle Vine as well, I seem to remember, because it, it, spa it, it spawned out it locations spread along... It, spe it spawned locations out along the ground, but it didn't mm. particularly check to see if anything else was there. Right. So <laughs> it would replace whatever lock was there. Then when right. it despawned, it would just delete it. So if it appeared on like the piers oh. around Port Sarim, right. it spread across the piers, vanished again, and then you had no more pier. And it was yep. just deleting whole chunks of maps. <laughs> so it was even more broken than I remember. It would yeah. be really cool to see something like that come back into the game. No. Just <laughs> because I really, really want to see it. Well, that, this is what old school's. Well, yeah, yeah, that is old school, isn't it? There we go. <laughs> we can so what, that. So we can basically, what we're saying is that Ash, you need to go out and get drunk, put something, <laughs> put something badly conceived into the game, and then come back. More drunk and we'll move it. You have that troll farming quest on your thing. You know, I, I genuinely think that if we pulled this, it would pass just because they've heard the story now. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Put it in your poll. Yeah. Tangle vine. Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. Yeah. I can make it to leak the floor and all. It would be cool as a PvP ability. <laughs> <laughs> a high level farming PvP ability. Yes, why not? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, it's got yeah. the cogs churning now, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Well, the so thing is, it's going to be easier to make that work and be broken than it is to like accidentally break it now. So you I mentioned that. Yeah. So, sorry. So you mentioned uh, a jolly. Now I know what that is. However, a lot of people like myself before I came here knew what a jolly was, as it's not a term I guess in North America. Maybe. So what exactly is a jagex jolly? Well, you boys want to answer Anything, that. Anything really. Yeah. What would so you like? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the original idea was sort of staff incentives, you know, we got to a certain number of players, uh, members, yeah. uh, we would go out and have a bit of fun. Uh, so it might be something like going to the bowling alley, going quad biking, whatever. All kinds Sounds of like a celebration. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. that comedy um, show, I think, was like the first yeah, one that, that we was a good one, yeah. 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 Oh, yes. with, oh with, with, um, with them doing the Troll Fortress yes. suggestion of yours. Yes, yeah. that, that was... Uh, that was a good jolly, that one. But also, we sometimes we'd go away. Mm. So we've uh, we uh, like one of my first jollies was a kind of weekend trip to the Lake District with mm. the whole company. Okay. Um, but then, um, when the company started getting really big, we did some quite extravagant jollies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, <laughs> we went to um, Tenerife. Mm. We went to Malta. They kind of flew us out there. Nice. One of them, there was a plane that was chartered. That was yeah, that was the Tenerife one. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been to New York for a weekend. The, the, New, uh, York, the New York one was fun because we, effect, we essentially had a chart um, of all our targets and when we would have the jollies. And that, um, that chart went up to 50,000 members. <laughs> Um, yes. And then there was a huge gap, and then at 100,000 members, we had New York. We were like, we're never, ever going to have 100,000 members. That's right. Um, <laughs> And for RS Classic, we, we got daily updates on our number of members. It was going up by about 500 members a day. Um, and so you got sort of like a jolly sort of about once a month. And then we released RuneScape 2. Yeah. And, and the subscription mental. rate just went through the roof. And we were hitting it was jollies. going up so quick, jollies. we couldn't keep up with we, it. We couldn't keep up with the jollies, and we just shot straight off the top of the jolly chart. I think we got about <laughs> 200,000 members by the time we got to New York to celebrate 100,000 members. Yeah, I yeah. think that's right. <laughs> I just remember the, the, uh, the day that we got 
Um, so like we passed the first milestone that I was there was uh, Rune Day 1337. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so like that's nice. around the office, yeah. Rune Days are our kind of internal calendar. They start at the 27th of February 2002, I think, that's when right. we launched mm. members, or yep. when they launched members, and um, counted up from there. Um, thousands of days now. Mm. 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 So sorry, Ian, you mentioned something about um, the beginning of RuneScape and not imagining getting 100,000 members. It reminded me of a question that I actually had. Um, so is it true that Rune was, was, was made up to level 40 because you never imagined anybody would ever pass level 40 in a skill? Uh, we cer uh, certainly, with the exponential curve we put on it, yeah. uh, I can't remember what we expected people to get to, but it, we certainly never expected anyone to get 99s. So you said 99 is like, no one's yeah, ever going to get basically. this. That's and now there's like, like this game will last and forever. And yeah. Uh, yeah. We never thought that anyone would get anywhere near 99. Yeah. It's just, it was mathematically <laughs> no way someone way. would enjoy the game that much. It was uh, well, that? the idea of this sort of like the grindy player, you know, yeah. sort of the, or the, the whole MMO kind of mentality mm. was still sort of like very much just starting out. And also about then, it would have been use pick on rock. Yeah. You swing or pick at the rock. You oh, you had to prospect the rock. first, yeah. didn't you? You did have to prospect. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you had to prospect the rock to find you out, had wasn't to it? Oh wow! The rock, f rock first, That's and then painful. you'd mine it, and then you would have one swing per click. And then it would miss and the rock. Fishing was click again. Perfect, you missed the rock. I think so. Yeah. You had to use the thing on the other thing. Yeah. Wow. I believe yeah. you once had an animation made for you swing your axe at the tree, you slip and miss the tree. Yes. And yes. it made yeah. you look really, really foolish. Yes. <laughs> well, when we went from RS Classic to RS, when we went from RS Classic to RS2, we automated the repeating. But it still had the message in you swing your axe at the yes. tree and you miss. Yeah. So we put in an animation for it. Which meant your player would sort of flail around for several seconds <laughs> missing the tree <laughs> before they finally tapped it and got a pile of logs. Yep. And it made your player look inebriated. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, so it was fun. <coughs> Do you recall the first ever 99? Who might have gotten that? 99. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know who got Never the first happened. one. Um, I know smithing came quite early. Because um, you, had, you, you, had yeah, you had the Steel Corporation who founded Tippet. And they, right. they worked together to supply the ore and get someone up to 99 smithing. What was your um, uh, what was your general reaction when Zezma started to kick up? Zezima, however you'd like to say him. Um, how did he become the legend that he is now? So in the early days, um, wh certainly when I started, my um, mentor was a player. Okay. So I was told that if I had any questions about the game, that I should log into the game and talk to these players right. to get the answers about the game. Because in customer support that back then, we would have like open tickets where people would be able to ask us questions about quests and things like that. And um, because the fan sites weren't um, anywhere near as good as they are now, yeah. um, quite often the information just wasn't out there. So um, if, I, if my colleagues were busy, I would log into the game and, and talk to players. And Zazim was one of the players that I would talk to. Yeah to get information about the game. He was all-knowing. So, so uh, he was all-knowing back yeah. then. And, and so my main contact was someone called Lady Deja Vu, okay. who was a, quite a, a big player back when I started. And was it uh, her friend as well? I can't remember what she was called. Um, and Zazima, they were my three that I would talk to. Mm. Uh, so to me, it was always like the font of all knowledge. Yeah. Um, and just played the game a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I would talk to him all the time. And very efficient. And still well. do now as well, so it was good. Mm. There you go, the more you learn. <laughs> um, all right, so next question. This is another one personally from me, just because I'm curious. How did the Zamrak, Guthix, Ceredim, and Gods come to be? Whose idea was that? Where did they come from? I, I think that was just a sort of, you know, fairly standard fantasy trope. You, mm. you, you know, you've got um, typically lawful, neutral, and chaotic as your sort okay. of three factions. and. You know, we just had a god for each of them. N nothing particular. <laughs> you know, a lot, a lot of the early game. You know, it was just we, we're throwing in those standard fantasy elements. Yeah. You, um, there's a on the internet you can find a sort of sketch of an early version of the map, and we just stuck on all the usual things like a treetop village and a volcano yeah. and Castle a wizard's tower and things yeah. like that. King Arthur yeah. and Merlin. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you know, once the game started getting bigger, we actually sort of had to start thinking about. Well, we need to actually start yeah. tying these storylines yeah. together, mm. um, making sense. a sort of cohesive whole. It's interesting that the whole kind of concept of a kind of pantheon of gods, or you know, whether the, you know Greek, Roman influences, whatever, the, yeah. the concept that there would there would be different gods that would represent a certain philosophy of looking at the world. Yeah. Um, 
was always there, but interestingly, I don't think it was ever Paul's intention to have them as clear cut as that. Yeah. Mm. So it's quite interesting now with the sixth stage in that we're experimenting with those ideas. Well, maybe Sarah Doman isn't all good. Maybe he's done things that he's justified in the past that other people would look at as being evil. And you see those things come across in some of the quests now. Okay. Um, it, was quite ob- it was quite easy for players to assume that this was bad, this was good, mm. this was neutral, yeah. because that was the way that they were um, portrayed. Yes, Father um, Eric says Sarah Doman is the good god. He um, uh, brings life to the world. Yeah. And that's what you meet in Lumbridge. It's all the law you get. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's, it's quite cool that there's still storylines that we're doing now yeah. which were originally conceived back in the day yeah. by Paul. That's we really just cool. never got around to doing it because there were always other things that we wanted yeah. to do. I don't imagine that story will ever end. No. It's probably just going to be ongoing forever. That's right. Yeah, well, we've got, um, what, a Zamorak quest this month. So yeah. There you go. All right. I just grab my next question. Actually, you know what? Another personal one, sorry, before we get into these. Right. <laughs> how, did, how did the 9 HP accounts come to be? I'm curious about those. That, that was just the conversion <laughs> over from uh, classic. classic to RS2. Okay. Is it because the XP formula was slightly different? So yeah. an account with yeah. a certain amount of XP would end up with a different, slightly different level as a result? I think that accounts that were created before a certain point yeah. had a default amount of um, hit point XP. Um, and then we realized that it was a really weird number that was kind of like a few points off being level 10. Okay. And so it got, just got rounded to level 10. But it meant that accounts that were created before that date still had, mm-hmm. I think it was like 1,000 uh, XP or something. I can't remember. That quite, would do it. About 1,000, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like a, um, and then we said, all right, we'll just add a few more to make it level 10. <laughs> But then suddenly you're creating these rare, yeah, I was rare say. level nine accounts. Although they're not as cool as the rare bearded lady accounts, though. I thought they were cooler <laughs> <laughs> back in the early day. There's some dialogue written specifically in case you're on one of those accounts when you talk yeah, to the quest NPC, that's right. like um, the dude um, Lubufu, the fisherman by Brimhaven Docks. Um, he's got dialogue. One of the questions is, "Do you meet many people here?" And he says, "I was recently talking to a young man called." Zezimo, or a young woman called Lady Deja Vu, and he's got an option for if it was um, one of these accounts. It's not very politically yeah, correct. Yeah, gender, gender neutral <laughs> accounts. Yeah. He's got special dialogue. I for hope that. that's been removed, really, because it's <laughs> not PC. <laughs> so, it, so it wasn't kind of like a try to catch them all, super rare account. Maybe if you make like a thousand accounts, you might, you might get a, a no, nine no, HP. Please no. do not do that trying. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was just accounts made before. So yeah, no. just literally cut me off before I could say, maybe it is. Go out and make <laughs> no, it. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Subscribe no, no. no. hmm. uh, If you want to pay for membership <laughs> for me, yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, I see yourself like at the mention, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, next question. So this is a bit more tricky. Um, what's been the toughest thing you've coded thus far? Any takers? I would say, sort of like wh- when we started doing it, um, uh, summoning was very tricky to code. I mean, uh, I'd still say it, it's probably it could probably contend quite well in a punch up with um, dungeoneering. It's uh, still being uh, one of our most complicated and skills, simply because it's so far reaching. Right. In dungeoneering, you do everything you can do in game, but you do it in a very self contained area. Whereas uh, summoning was everywhere. Yeah. yeah e- even with like the initial restrictions on exactly where you could take all of your pets and the rest of it, um, but I mean, I- I've I've mentioned this a few times. We had we didn't have and at that point when we were, like as a, as a coding context, we couldn't do like ands as we was going through. So we, we so we were doing like all of these sort of like checks and all of the uh, the coding to make the creatures work, and they were they were quite complicated. They still are. You know, we, we've upgraded it significantly since, um, but back then it was pretty tricky and I was quite proud that I managed to boil each individual creature down to about 200 to 300 lines of code as just nice. normal and then just had this sort of like back end engine handling all of these kind of things but it was it was pretty tricky. Interesting. Mm. What are you going to say Ash? Oh, for me I think it would be the 2007 initial launch of Clan Wars. That wasn't originally my project. Um, one of my colleagues was working on that and he regrettably resigned from Jagex to spend more time with his family or something. So um, he was leaving with um, the project in testing, but it needed shepherding through testing. The trouble is, one of the difficulties that the testers were finding is that for the teams, he tried to base it on chat channels, but not. 
So if you switched chat channel mid-game, the game couldn't tell, so you stayed on the wrong team. Or if the person who was the owner of that chat channel wasn't in the battle or tried to have their own battle, it got very confused about what was going on. So um, with very little time, because it was already in testing and needed to be signed off pretty darn quick, I had to um, find some way of writing code that checked what chat channel you were in and make a battle game out of it. Now the commands we'd got for that were written for loot share. The idea was that chat channels were going to be the loot share system. Mm -hmm. And um, I sort of piggybacked on loot share to write this massively multiplayer battle game, which no one had tried doing anything like that before. I pulled it off in about 10 hours. Ooh. So, <laughs> yeah. and it worked after that. So I was quite proud of it, but um, all the same, I knew I could have done it better with a bit more time. And in 2009, we came back and did it better with yes. a bit with more features. Yeah. Mm. At which point it became rather more my clan was uh, how with all with two years of um, retrospect and experience to try and make it better than we'd have been able to do at the time. Yeah, would have thought clan wars was that tricky. Well, conveniently, it meant I knew how to write it when old school wanted one, yeah. which um, <laughs> meant that this time we approached the engine team and said we wanted commands for writing clan wars, which would also allow loot share. Whereas in the first place, they created commands for doing loot share, which calls for write clan wars. I like that. On Mark, anything specific? Um, I have only ever coded one thing, which I'm sure these guys are very pleased about, um, which is Bob the Cat. Bob uh, the Cat? Yeah. Uh, nice. I was, uh, was, I think I'd only been a content team lead for about a couple of months. The yeah. first thing I did was create a monthly behind the scenes because I always thought it was very important. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, we started playing around with the idea of themed months, and we started playing around with Ikthorin's Little Helper and the idea of a desert-themed month. And I wanted to do some cool stuff with cats, and we had this kind of idea that you could have this Roman cat that you could talk to all around the place, which yeah. was, again, a mistake. It wasn't ever supposed to be like that. The cat was just given the maximum wander range that okay. it could do in the game. and then We didn't even notice until the player no, started exactly. saying, oh Some yeah, we're herding this cat. Someone, what? someone <laughs> let, the <laughs> let the cat out of the garden. The cat was created as part of Death Plateau, and the, and the artist just put the maximum wander range on it just to see how far it could go. And then the players <laughs> started playing around with it, and so we thought, oh, we'll write some dialogue for him, and then we did yeah. a few more bits with cats. Right. Um, and I wrote something, and it created a horrific amount of pack errors which is basically <laughs> when the code goes, <coughs> something bad is happening here. Um, and all the developers were like, what are you doing, Mark? Because I was just <laughs> messing everyone up. Uh, and then this chap called Chris Joyce come in and fixed it up for me. Um, and that was the one and only thing I've ever coded in the game. There There's plenty go. of stuff that I've written and loads of stuff that I've designed, but that's the only thing that I've coded. Interesting. And therefore is the most difficult thing that I have coded. So the cat was never actually a JMod controlling it, just spying on the players. <coughs> it nope. was just a wandering nah. NPC. Yeah. If we want to spy on the players, we turn our JMods invisible and go wander around like that. Yeah, we'd never do that. We do not yeah. become the cat. Although and it's tempting. <laughs> Ian, anything in particular? Um, Working on so much stuff. I mean, game engine uh, is, is tended to be you know, it's more technical than content. We've, we've exper experimented with various things. We did try out a WASD control system for um, really? RuneScape. Um, uh, I had great fun coding that. Uh, still felt quite weird, though, because you still had uh, grid-based blocking. So you'd sort of run towards a gap between a pair of trees, and you'd just go <laughs> dunk and hit straight into it. So it never we never actually put that live in the game because it just felt too weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, Trying to get through a door was special. Yes. Um, <laughs> a door is one tile <laughs> wide, so are you, and you had to line up now. <laughs> that was a heavily requested thing for quite some time, especially with old school, was uh, the WASD um, yeah. controls up there. I yeah. always wondered how that but, worked. But yeah, <laughs> the main problem is you would have basically had to have remapped the entire game yeah. and then put in proper blocking so that you, you could actually run around trees but not create huge shortcuts such that you could get through to the elven lands without having done the crests or something crazy yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Also gets a bit awkward in, say, shops where, you know, we're used to a game where you walk, you click to get into a shop by just clicking inside the shop and the game finds a way for you. And you click on the shopkeeper and the game walks you around the shop counter and you talk to the shopkeeper. With WASD controls, um, you'd actually have to 
remember where the door was, navigate to it, bounce off the walls a few times until you manage to fit yourself through the door. And then walk around the counter, bouncing off the walls all the way until you got near the shopkeeper. And then the shopkeeper would move around the other side. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. he like, can navigate. Because he can navigate just fine. <laughs> so you end up with these lovely little dosy dos around, <laughs> around uh, shelves. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I haven't really coded anything into the game because I'm just purely QA. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, d I have written a load of code because I test the engine basically right. I try and make sure all the commands working before the content guys get to get to look at it but uh, yeah I haven't uh, made the players suffer fortunately with any of my content that's all right <laughs> all right next question let's bring it up so um all right this is a good one for anybody interested in pursuing a possible job like yourselves um, from true rocks and he asks did you go to college slash university if so what for and how did it bring you here um, well, I did go to university and it did bring me here because um, <laughs> I was kind of drinking in the same bar as this guy called Andrew who kept <laughs> talking about some RuneScape thing for which he was writing members, whatever that meant. And um, his mates told me it was this silly thing you put on the internet where you, people click on rocks all day. And so I went home and read the whole website, like all 20 pages of it or whatever it was in those days. Thought I've got to get me some of that. <laughs> Created an account and started I'll playing. Get me some of them rocks. Yeah, and I started to click on them rocks. I chose to be a miner in the class system we it, had back it's then. It's a game, <laughs> but it's on the internet. Yeah, and I got uh, internet in Halls of Residence, so I could try this thing. Never really went into games before that. Mm. So yeah, that's how university led me to Jagex. I spent probably too much of third and fourth year studying RuneScape, and it stood me <laughs> in very good stead for my eventual career. What yeah. did you? What was your subject that you were studying? Material science at the University of Cambridge. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so I I didn't go to university. Okay. Um, when I, I was applying for universities and a job came up at uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which is what I mean. Without Dungeons and Dragons, probably none of this would exist. Because yeah. like certainly, <laughs> certainly these boys got massively and inspired by it yeah. when, when they were kids. Um, and. Uh, and so I said, no, I'm not going to go to university. I'm going to go and get my dream job ever. And I yeah. went and worked for Dungeons and Dragons. So um, did a lot of event organizing and things like that. And then slowly started getting involved in the craft of, of games design. Um, so they were playing around with this. Uh, there were a lot of collectible card games out at the time. And, and, with, and uh, Dungeons and Dragons had tried to do it with something called Spellfire which didn't really work very well. Okay. Um, and then they created um, something called Dragon Dice, which was a collectible dice game. Um, and I got involved with giving some feedback on a couple of ideas that they'd had. And then we started getting involved in little bits of um, games design. Um, and then uh, started um, a company where we were doing event organizations and like writing events for people. And so it was another sort of games design. Yeah. And then I wasn't making any money doing that, so I went off and did horrible corporate and salesy type things. Oh, fine. And then when <laughs> and then when the opportunity at Jagex came up, I was like, oh, I'd quite like to get back in the games industry. Yeah. And it was amazing to me how many skills that I'd learned before about games design and about the theory of how you approach games design that were valid here. Yeah. And I think it would be fair to say when I started, there were no concept of design documents or <laughs> QA test plans or like actually just thinking what do we want to be doing in a year's time. No one really thought like that because everyone was still just so surprised that we were making money <laughs> and we were working, <laughs> making games. There wasn't any of that kind of structure which I hope um, helps designers and uh, developers to actually get the most out of their time and actually put their own creativity in the game. So, Interesting. sorry, long answer, but sorry. I didn't go to university, but I got all my experience making games outside of computers. Fascinating story. Ian? Um, <coughs> obviously, uh, I was working here before I went to university. Well, not here, here, but working on Jagex funded games yeah. before going to university. Um, I did go to university, but sort of Intermingling it, in, intermingling the two things. Um, studied computer science at Cambridge, um, but I already had a job lined up for an <laughs> left effectively. Um, yeah, I uh, Andrew actually went to Cambridge sort of five years before me, and you know, 
uh, I saw him go there and I was kind of like, I'm going to go to Cambridge. I'm not going to have him do better than me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Always so the competition <laughs> between the Gower brothers, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I was definitely going to do it. I had a great time at university, you know, made a lot of uh, lifelong friends. So, wouldn't change that. Interesting. How but many? Sorry, go ahead. How many? How many? Uh, how many hours do you think in your spare time you were working? Because it's it's got to be tough doing university and working on RuneScape in your spare time. Well, it was mostly during the holidays that I would yeah, come back okay. here to work on the game. Officially, the university has a rule of not uh, doing a part-time job actually during yeah. the term times. Um, but you know, I came back each summer and each winter. Um, um, so I. I so sort of summer of 2002, uh, we had the big push when we were converting from RS Classic to RS2. So I converted a lot of the skills yeah. um, from RS Classic to RS2 during that period. Interesting. All right. Mm -hmm. And order? Um, well, I didn't do any further education or anything like that. In fact, actually, I don't even think I did ICT at school. Mm -hmm. um, it was Listing all the stuff I've done before I've come here would be way too too much, but um, basically I've always had a sort of testing experience. Um, the IT job I had before I moved to Jagex um, was, again, it was testing software, um, desktop software, and then we started getting into games and things like that. Um, I was actually the, I believe, the first externally recruited QA person yeah, in the that's company. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're the first person we hired to actually test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like Everyone like like else became a tester and yes. they stopped being one again. <laughs> so I, being one. I, I kinda got um, got made redundant from the IT job I had before and then uh, took a year break and basically found the advert for Jagex and yeah. Had a look at it online, initially saw Classic and thought, what the heck? Um, and then saw RS2 uh, and thought, actually, yeah, this could go places. Yeah. You know, this could be really good. And Interesting. applied and got the job. So you, so. so you enjoy finding things that are wrong with things and then saying, you know what, I think I can fix this. And that's pretty much how, how you... No, it's, it's more just enjoy finding things wrong with things and then getting other people to fix them. Okay. <laughs> really. Yep. I'm, I'm good at tearing apart other people's code, I think, <laughs> really. <laughs> Right, Wilson. Uh, well, I I went to university uh, up in Stirling. It was just software engineering. It wasn't uh, specifically game related. Yep. And uh, after that, I was looking for a job that was just going to use that degree. I was looking uh, sort of uh, started looking in Scotland. Then I started looking you know further afield because there wasn't actually a lot available at that time. And obviously, as a recent graduate, there's this kind of catch twenty two of they want people with game with experience but you can't get the experience without actually getting the job. And uh, in the end, uh, sort of like, well, one of the, the many, many jobs I applied for was, uh, was down here. And uh, sort of like I turned up, um, having prepared myself by reading Fortean Times and uh, with a folder containing a handful of ideas for uh, sort of short quests and a story about cows eating people in Texas. That's right. And uh, yeah, and I... And oh, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> and I am now living proof that our hiring policy has become a great deal stricter <laughs> over the years. <laughs> but yeah, it was, um, it, was, it was great. It was um, sort of like I turned up for that interview uh, just, just as Isabel was leaving. Yeah. Um, and then uh, from hers, and uh, then got, they got me down. I did the Olaf thing, and we sat around talking about what you, fish bowls, yep. sort of like on the heads and the rest of it. And uh, yeah. then, yeah, so sort of like hired and uh, came down here. Tony was the first person I hired. Interesting. Yeah. Not the first person I interviewed, but the first person mm. I hired. <laughs> yeah. Cows eating people? In Texas? Yeah, it was yes. horrific. Yeah. Oh. Zombie like, cows. There were zombie cows okay, eating zombie people. Cows, yes. Yes. Yeah. This is genuinely disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> that is the one thing we're missing from RuneScape right now, is some genuinely disturbing content. Fair enough. Don't oh, I had a go for the snake boss. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so we don't have a ton of time left, unfortunately. Um, we're going to try to kind of quick fire through some of these questions. Um, so let's start with uh, this one from Seven Letters. So what caused climbing boots to spike in price? Um, just quickly, uh, we knew that the uh, price of them in-game were not anywhere near the um, value of the item of on the player trade. Yeah. So we looked at all the climbing boots that existed in the game. We worked out where they were. Um, we, we knew, uh, well, I say what exactly where, where they were, we knew how many of them existed in the game. Yeah. Um, and we knew that, I think it was 76k or something like that, yeah. um, was the price that they were generally being traded for, or were the equivalent, um, the cost of the effort that it was going to be to get them. Yeah. And so we decided that we should rebalance the cost of the item. The, the downside of that, 
unfortunately, was that some players benefited from the change more than yeah. others. Interestingly, it was only a couple of accounts that were kind of um, where there were a lot more climbing boots there than average. Most yeah. people just had one or two on their accounts. I only had two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Damn. Um, but there was no, there was uh, like, it was never any kind of like dodginess going on in terms of like making people millionaires overnight. Yeah. Like we didn't, we didn't know which accounts had the, mu- the, the boots. We knew how many of them existed in the game. We knew what we were doing to the economy. And generally it was the right thing to do. Yep. It was just unfortunate that players looked at it because there were one or two extreme examples that were different yeah. for everybody else and they were focused on. And that is quite often the case with a lot of things that go slightly wrong. There are one or two extreme examples of something going a bit wrong yeah. and that tends to be what the focus is on. Actually, as an overall product, it was the right thing to do. Yeah, I'd say they were slightly <coughs> undermined at whatever they were, 250 GP each or whatever. Yeah. 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 Just, just slightly. Yeah. But uh, all right, next question. This one's from Ed Hicks and he asks, What's your favorite update that's come to the game that you've been a part of? You start going around, mm. Ash? Um, the Clan Citadel Battlefield. I'm very proud of that. It's not Sparking. often seen on account of it's on Clan Citadels. Um, so people aren't into clans, don't always see it. But I'm, I've tried to write a map editor so you can draw your own battlefield and set your own rules. I mean, I did it. I'm very pleased with that. Is and it? I would love to get something like that in old school. <laughs> All right. Um, dungeoneering. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, most of the bits of skills <coughs> and interfaces is sort of less player facing. The obvious biggest piece of single content I did was the hunter skill. Hunter. Um, is that what you're most proud of? What am I most proud of? I. I'd say it's probably what you're most known for. Is that of the logo? Yeah, yeah the original one. logo is probably the thing which has been seen the most. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The party hat there. is probably the most coveted of all the things <laughs> I've drawn. A lot of people like Hunter, though. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of which, that is a chin champ on the table. Yes. Uh, anyways. <laughs> uh, his name is Magnus. Next. <laughs> um, Monkey Madness. Oh, interesting. I think. Um, mostly because it was just a huge amount of fun to QA it, to test it. Um, when I first started testing it, the um, developer had the mind of, we're going to make this the most difficult thing in the game. Yeah. Uh, even on my testing account, I would last five minutes. Uh, those caverns underneath the, uh, the island, it's like you got poisoned, you got hit, you had rocks land on you. I didn't yeah. even have time to basically give myself extra healing. It was and like, bang, you're dead. The spike hits you yeah. from the wall. Yeah, so it was a case of, yeah, I think we need to tone this down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say the... OMG quest rework, including um, Let Them Eat Pie. I mean, it's sort of like, as, as a whole, simply because it was so huge, it was like three quest, quest rewrites and a new quest. Yeah. You know, sort of like getting it out all in one big go was like this big uh, thing. And obviously, uh, I've seen a lot of Let's Plays of Let Them Eat Pie right. and the uh, horrible noises on that. And that, that's just, you know, it just amuses me. All right. Yeah, I think just, just a quick interjection. One update, actually, I think which went down very well was in about 2003. I've been writing this thing in my free time uh, um, and we had a hole in the release schedule where something was supposed to be released that week and at the last second there was a sort of panic if it wasn't going to be ready what else can we launch this week and I turned around to I think it, it, I think it was Paul at the time and said I, I've got these things uh, where you can see all the level advancement in game by clicking on a skill and I've also changed all these interfaces I've added this uh, feature where you can select make X and sort of make oh. 28 of an item all in one go. And that was just something I'd sort of coded because I thought it would make you know, life yeah. a little bit <laughs> more pleasant and less ISI inducing. And so we launched that and I think that's probably actually the single most popular update I've put out just sort of like. <laughs> wow, we don't have to go one. click, 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 click. All right, uh, next question. Um, so this one's from Absil. How much work is involved in the creation of a song for RuneScape and what's your personal favorite track? I guess I'll get this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well, it depends what the song's like, going to be like. Take the new tracks added for Zorlandra and the Zora snake boss. The one you hear in the village, um, Thrall of the Serpent, I knocked that one out in about three hours one evening. It's a very simple thing, just a chord sequence and with a tune played twice, um, once with an upper octave with more um, ornamentation. So that was very quick to write, but it gives you a nice spooky feel to the area, and it seems to tick the boxes. The other one, Coil, when you're fighting Zorva itself, there's a lot more to that one, because frankly there's a lot more music to it, and I was working on that in the evenings for uh, probably about 
a week or thereabouts. Um, Your favourite one so far? From RS3, Icklagor the Thunderer. I don't know which of the team wrote that, but I love it. Interesting. Unfortunately, I can't say another one off the top of my head. I, I, like, <laughs> I like Norse code just because of the okay. encoded message. <laughs> there's, there's a lot behind that song. Would you care to explain that? Um, I, I don't, I don't know how much is behind it exactly. I know it's got the encoded message, which I think is great. I think that's that was exactly actually, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was even picked up by some random TV series actually, in a, uh, actually referenced that we had an encoded message in the song in RuneScape. We were kind of like, okay, the people who write this TV series clearly play RuneScape. That's that, awesome. That's surprising. Right. Um, I think. My favourite tune is the original yeah. um, Scape Main, actually, yes. because it means so much. Yeah. And I just remember this one day where I was looking on YouTube and there was a guy who'd done the Scape Main on an electric oh, guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and I swear to you, like, the whole That's office, great. we were just like, that is amazing. Yeah. And, like, I genuinely get, like, a, a, a real high when I think about, yeah. like, that, that kind of... Um, that tune. Yeah. I um, mean, it's really amazing now where we get these huge, like, you know, like 50, 60 uh, member orchestras, like, playing these huge new tunes written by famous people. But there's always that kind of vibe of yeah. original Escape Main in there somewhere, mm -hmm. like a little melody in the background. And I absolutely love that. So I would say that's my favourite. Awesome. When Old School was being brought out, one of the first things that worked was <coughs> the login screen playing the music. And um, a whole group of us just gathered around to see the login screen with that flames. tune playing, just to <coughs> listen to the whole thing all the way through because we missed it. <laughs> I honestly don't have a favourite. Really? Yeah, I just, there, there are just so many in there that I really do enjoy. Yeah. Um, I mean, the uh, the ones associated with Ape at all, where you've got the monkeys chirping away, you know. Um, yeah, and the, the a lot of the newer stuff as well, where we've done the orchestra. So seriously can't pick. Fair enough. Uh, for me it comes down to kind of a coin toss, I mean sort of like all, all of the, the older stuff and the reworked version of the older stuff, like the reworked version of the themes and the, the other ones that we've gone back and kind of revisited, I like. But um, I still just like the um, the two more lyrical ones where we've got the, the uh, Glutton for nourish, uh, yeah, Glutton Glutton for for nourishment and the Death's House theme uh, from the last Halloween event. Okay. Uh, so it's a coin toss between those two, basically. Yeah, you, know, you know, now that I think about it, sorry, personally, I think I really like the one that we had for this last Christmas event um, with Old School. I forget the name of that song. Uh, Diango's Little Helpers. Mm. Was, it, was, that, was that the name of the one that was playing in Verrock? Oh, in Verrock. Don't know what was playing there. Uh, it, it was one of the Christmas tunes, I forget, I forget the name of it. Jingle, no, Mary. <coughs> I would also I would also have special mention for um, the um, uh, cathedral. What's the cathedral one we did? The, uh, the one on the edge of the desert. Oh, um, the Saint Ethelred is happy. Yes, the one yeah. piercing note. One piercing Seriously. note. Because that was Seriously. the first. Because my objective for that was to say. I want us to write a piece of content where players feel compelled to turn their mu music on. And so we went absolutely full out on that mm. with all the voice acting and yeah. some crazy, crazy songs that were written. Yeah. Um, and that, I would say, would come a close second. But it doesn't quite have the nostalgic appeal. Yeah, well, I can see that. All right, we've only got, well, we've got a lot of questions left. We don't have a ton of time, so let's try to make these quick. <coughs> um, so what happened to the life rune? What exactly was the life rune? Life rune... As you'd expect, it was the sort of counterpart to the death rune. Um, I don't think we ever specifically had any plans for what it was going to be used for, no. but there was room for expansion. Um, never got used. Yeah. No potential it'll ever make its way to the game. Oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure. Sure, it can do. Yeah. If we can. Yeah. Kind of feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of feel like. Well, I want to do some more stuff with soul rune first. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next if question. If anything. Um, why was the Rotten Potato chosen to be the JMAR tool? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mod Martin B was r launching farming. Nice table, this. And um, uh, f around that point, we were aware that um, players could look through the code of the client and find out names and descriptions of all the items in it. So when we realised we needed a sort of helper object that we could click on to accelerate growth cycles, um, get the farming crops into whatever state we needed for testing in the live game. We needed an item that JMods could give themselves and do testing with, but we knew that players would be able to see what it was called. So we gave it a nice innocuous name, Rotten Potato. 
stick that out with the rest of the farming skill, no one's going to look twice and s to wonder why the, their potatoes are never rotten. So that's why they called it that. Oh, is it? It could have just as easily been rotten egg or, um, or dev spoon. Moldy plant. Mm. Dragon right, toothpick right. was one of my favourite things Mod John A ever came up mm -hmm. with. Dragon toothpick. And dragon sponge. <laughs> Alrighty then. Um, have to be very careful using a dragon toothpick. Don't want to slip. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's go for this one. This is a fun one. Have you pulled any <coughs> pranks, be it in game or in office, that you're willing to share? I had a prank pulled on me, which I thought was quite a cool one. So um, it's well known around the office that I hate mint. I oh. don't like the smell of mint. Okay. It offends me. Not taken. Uh, I'm not quite as bad <laughs> with it these days as I used to be. Yeah. Um, it used to make me vomit, but not, not, not so much anymore. I went away on holiday for a week. I came back and my entire desk was covered in polos. Um, <laughs> Mod Bennett, who was a guy who made Castle Wars and quite a few updates for us <coughs> uh, back in the day, um, he had taken the time and effort to place a polo, which is a, a, for you Americans that don't know what a polo is. I don't know you. I don't know what a polo Who knows? is. Well, a polo is a, is, a, is a mint with a hole in the middle. Okay. Um, and uh, he had put a polo mint on every single key on my keyboard, which I thought was like the next level. <laughs> and I, I, I think for the next year, I would just find random polo mints just in and around my desk. I were like cleaning my desk or opening a drawer or opening a folder I hadn't, and polos would just fall out. So I think that was the, that was the best prank that yeah. I can remember, but that was pulled on me rather than... I did something in game once where there'd been a bug in the duel arena where if you threw a gnome ball at somebody just to say we're about to go into a duel that messed up the script that was meant to unequip their items and they could end up in a no weapons duel with a weapon or something. Now, Mod Nexus and I worked together and fixed that, and deployed the fix as a hot fix without the service rebooting. Uh, so then we went in, made ourselves invisible to go and um, see in the live game whether it was now fixed or not. And um, I forget whether it was or not, but what we found was a whole bunch of um, players trying to abuse the bug. And um, they were throwing no balls to each other, and they weren't getting anywhere, they couldn't reproduce the bug anymore, which was well, a result from our point of view. So uh, once we were satisfied that um, we weren't going to learn anything more from them, we started throwing gnome balls at them from our invisible J mods. So whenever they threw a gnome ball, we threw a gnome ball. So um, they carried on for a while and um, then said, so you've got the gnome, no I've got the gnome ball. We can't both have the gnome ball. Have we found a gnome ball duping bug? Hey. Uh, <laughs> no, there's a J mod trolling us. It must be it. Nice one J mod. So we made ourselves visible. Thank them for their time and um, left them to it. Oh, and lit a fire on their foot from an invisible J-Mod because um, they could see the fire. They don't know where it came from, but it seemed like the thing to do. Interesting. I, mean, I can still do that, can't I? I oh, can yes. Totally you can still do that. wander around being an invisible firelighter. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> as you do. Hunter traps also. Any others? Not exactly a prank, but one I quite liked um, was uh, uh, my mum getting in on the whole sort of cabbage thing. Um, one, I think it was on one of Andrew's birthdays, he got a square parcel uh, and opened it up and she painted him this lovely oil painting of a cabbage so he could hang that up in his office <laughs> at work. And I think he did have it there until he left. <laughs> so what is this obsession with cabbage? Why is cabbage so good? <sighs> well, it's not good. Have, have, you have, have, you tried eating, have you tried eating one in game? Have you looked I at the message? It says, yeah. yuck, I hate cabbage. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you, uh, clearly you've never met Brassica Prime. No. Right. Well, if you had, then you'd know. you just mm. know. Cab cabbages are cool. But uh, I think they were originally put in the game because they were just there, they were put on the ground. Well, I mean, even sort of um, prior to the game, and I don't know if the signature came first or the cabbage thing came first, Andrew at one point signed a lot of his emails with an at sign, which we, you know, we said was a cabbage for Before some reason. Twitter I don't, um, I don't know if the cabbage thing came from the at sign or the at sign came from the cabbage, but it, was, it, it definitely existed prior to RuneScape. He signed my copy of Betrayal at Falador with two square brackets with an at symbol in between and said it was a cabbage in a box. Yes. <laughs> All right. So and cabbage, uh, cabbage, uh, the Cabbage Clan were, yeah, and still are the best clan that ever existed, ever. There because you go. We, we do uh, big cabbage orientated events where people would just get together in the cabbage field and see if you could pick all the cabbages at the same time. It was the, the, the time line. that he basically set up the chat filter so instead of starring it out, it would yep. say cabbage. Yep. Yeah. 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 And yeah. 
All right, so I think we kind of have time for one last question. It's a, it's a RuneScape related question, don't worry. Okay. Um, and this one's from Kuba MC, who asks, what's something you know now that you wish you would have known in the early days of creating RuneScape? It's a good question. Ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> check where the buy player is the when a queue runs. It avoids bugs. I was going to say buy all the party hats. Yes, Probably. actually, that mm. is a good one, because when we did the party hat drops, um, I actually got some, because most of us, I think all of us, have got our own personal playing accounts. Yeah. Um, and I was actually involved in sort of dropping the crackers for people to get the party hats. Oh, and so that, that was you that was dropping uh, them. Um, I, can't, I can't remember. The very first drop events, uh, I know we actually had to manually give them to the, our mod accounts. Uh, and drop them behind as as we went. So I think that might have been the case for the pumpkins. Okay. And you had to have the players following the mods along, trying to sort of pick up the uh, holiday events. I think by the time of the Christmas crackers, we actually had a uh, uh, a sort of cheat command which spawned uh, so, party yeah. ha uh, well, Christmas crackers across the whole world. Um, and I actually, you know, I of course had some of these on my personal playing account. And a few days after Christmas, I uh, saw various people, you know, a bit sad that they hadn't managed to get one of these party hats, and I had a few on my personal account, so I was handed them all out to various people. And I don't have any party hats <laughs> on my personal account anymore. <laughs> um, didn't make that mistake when the Santa hats came around. I got a lot of Santa hats. No <laughs> party hats there. That would be worth knowing, actually, because um, I was in the game when Halloween masks were dropped all over the place by that automatic thing you described. And um, I saw one, picked it up, thought, this is stupid. What is this? Put it back on the ground and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> um, biggest lesson for me would be um, it's, it's, it, it's important mm. to make sure that what you've got is working before you add something new. Yeah. It's so long that we've made the game where we've always been looking forwards. We've, for such a long time, we're like, update this week, update this week, and yep. we just didn't have the time mm. or actually the desire to look at what we already had because yep. we were always focused on what was coming out in the next update. And I think it was probably about f five or six years ago we actually realised that we should stop doing that and we should focus on making sure the stuff we've got works. Yeah. That is one of the reasons why we've got such a, a massive game which is full of things that just don't work because we just took too long to get to a point where we realised that that was a problem. Yeah. I know that sounds incredibly daft, but um, it's because we're always focused on what's the new shiny thing that we're doing. Of course. Um, and we spend so much more time now looking at what already exists and making that function. Yeah. That things like the Ninja Team is a perfect example of that for us in RS3. Um, and but also just the ways that, way that the old school team work as well, like very focused on making sure the stuff that's there works in the way that it should. Um, and if we hadn't spent such a long time before we realised that we really should be doing that, then we wouldn't have so many weird things in the game right now that we probably will never get to fix. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it, it seems it kind of gets to the point where there are so many really, really good ideas, but you simply you'll never have time to put all those in. That's game. right. Yeah. Um, so I believe we've run out of time, as I don't want to keep you guys here too long. Um, so we'll thank all of our participants very much for tuning in. Um, Mod Ash, Mod Mark, Ian Gower, Mod Nolador, right. Mod Wilson, and myself, Mod Archie. So we'll thank you guys for watching. Be sure to give the stream a follow if you enjoyed. And uh, we just might do another one of these in the future. We'll have yeah. to see. Yeah, for that. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.